Let's go. Uh, well, Professor Chomsky, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Uh, I know you're swamped with interview requests all the time. Um, so on behalf of Labor Notes, just thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Glad to. Um, so I wanted to, to start out with uh, getting your thoughts generally on the unprecedented moment we're in. Um, we're obviously in the midst of both a global pandemic and a global recession. And right now, millions of people in the United States have found themselves both unemployed and uninsured, while our healthcare system is overloaded and lacking anything close to the number of hospital beds and ventilators and personal protective equipment that we need. And I know we could spend the whole half hour, you know, on this question alone, but Kind of in brief strokes, I'm wondering if you could just outline for us how to understand the current moment we're in and the political choices that led us here. Well, first of all, we should recognize that unless we get to the roots of this pandemic, it's going to recur, uh, probably in worse form, uh, simply because of the manipulations of the uh, capital system, which are trying to great uh, circumstances in which will be worse for their benefit. We can see that in the stimulus bill and many other things. Now, second, because of the, in, of the uh, global warming, which is going on and puts all of this into the shadow. Um, we will recover from this that severe cost. We're not gonna recover from the ongoing melting of the polar ice sheets. And if you wanna understand how contemporary capital is looking at this, Let's take a look at Trump's budget. It's true that this is a pathological extreme of the normal capitalist system, so maybe it's not fair to use it as an example, but that's what we're living with. So on February 10th, while the epidemic was raging, going to get worse, uh, Trump came out with his uh, budget proposals. What were they? First point, for, uh, continue the defunding of health related elements of the government. Uh, throughout his term, he'd been cutting back on funding of anything that doesn't benefit private power and private wealth and corporate power. So all the health related parts of the government had been increasingly defunded. The killed programs, all sorts of things. February 10th, Let's continue with that. So further defunding of the center of disease control and other health related parts of the government. But there were also compensating increases in the budget for the fossil fuel industry, more subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. So let's try not only to kill as many people as possible now, but let's try to destroy all of society. It's basically what the words mean. Of course, more funding for the military and for his famous wall. But these two things stand out very brightly as an indication of the criminality that is, first of all, endemic, but is highlighted in the sociopathic White House, which brings it out radically. But of course, Trump can't be blamed for all of this. It goes back. Uh, and we better think about it. Uh, after the uh, SARS epidemic in 2003, also a coronavirus, it was well understood by scientists that other uh, recurrences of one or another coronavirus are going to come probably more serious. Well, understanding is not enough. Someone has to pick up the ball and run with it. Now, there are two possibilities. One is the drug companies but they follow normal capitalist logic. You do what makes profit tomorrow. You don't worry about the fact that in a couple of years, everything's gonna collapse. That's not your problem. So the drug companies essentially did nothing. There were things that could be done. I mean, there, were, there was plenty of information circulating. Uh, uh, scientists knew what to do. There could have been preparations. Somebody's gotta pay for it not the drug companies. Well, in a rational world, even a capitalist world, prior to Ronald Reagan, the government could have stepped in and done it, okay? Well, that's pretty much the way polio was eradicated. Very uh, a government initiated and funded program when Jonas Salk uh, 
discovered the vaccine, uh, he insisted that there be no uh, no patents. It's uh, he said it's got to be public, just like the sun. Uh, that's still capitalism, but it's regimented capitalism. That was ended by a, with, at a stroke by Ronald Reagan. Governments, the problem. It's not the it's not the solution. Let's uh, legalize tax havens. Let's legalize stock buybacks, costing tens of trillions of dollars to the public in pure robbery. And uh, uh, of course, let's keep funding the parts of the government. Let's continue. Government is the solution when the private sector is in, problem, in trouble. That's understood. But if it's just the public that needs something, government's not the answer. So going back to 2003, government couldn't step in. Uh, actually, it did, to a slight extent, step in. And it's very revealing to see what happened. Uh, Obama, after the Ebola crisis, recognized that there are problems. We have to do something. And one of them did several things. One of them was to try to uh, contract for ventilators. Ventilators are the big bottleneck in the system right now. That's what's forcing nurses to decide who to kill tomorrow. Uh, there aren't enough of them. But the Obama administration did contract for the development of uh, high quality, low cost uh, uh, ventilators. The company was quickly bought up by a bigger one, which sidelined the project. It was competing with their own expensive ventilators and then turned to the government and said they want to get out of the contract, it's not profitable enough. Okay, That's savage capitalism, not just capitalism, but neoliberal capitalism. It gets worse. In January and February of this year, this year, when US intelligence services were pounding at the door of the White House saying, hey, there's a real crisis, do something, couldn't do it. But the Trump administration was doing something, namely it was exporting ventilators to China and other countries to improve the trade balance. That went on into March. Now the same manufacturers and shipping companies that were sending them out are bringing them back, double profit. This is what we're living with, you know? I mean, can easily go on. So if you look back over the whole thing, at the basis is a colossal market failure. The markets simply don't work. They can work for selling shoes sometimes, but uh, if anything significant happens, it's none of their business. Uh, you have to operate as Milton Friedman and others pointed out just by greed. You do things for your own welfare, wealth, nothing else. It's a built-in disaster. Uh, we've had so many examples. I don't have to review it. So at the beginning is a market failure. Then comes the extra hammer blow of savage capitalism, neoliberalism, which we've been suffering from all over the world for 40 years. Uh, it goes beyond ventilators. Hospitals in the United States have to be run on a business model. So no spare capacity. It doesn't work even in normal times. And plenty of people, including me, can testify on that in the best hospitals. But it kind of works. However, if anything goes wrong, you're sunk. Tough luck. Uh, maybe that's okay for automobile manufacturing. Doesn't work for healthcare. Our healthcare system altogether is an international scandal. But the business model, of course, it puts it, just makes it a, a built-in disaster. So there's that. And uh, you know, some of the other things that went on are just too surreal to discuss. Like there was a, the was called the U.S. did have a, a U.S. aid had a program, very successful program for detecting viruses that are in animal populations, wild populations that are getting into closer contact with humans because of habitat destruction and global warming. So they were identifying thousands of potential disease viruses, working in China as well. Trump disbanded it. 
He had been defunding it, but he disbanded it with exquisite timing in October, just when the thing was breaking out. Now, if you go on and on, this is the picture you get. A bunch of sadistic sociopaths in the White House uh, intensifying deep market failures that go much farther back. Uh, and now intensifying it further. Uh, the rich are not waiting to see how to build the next world. They're working on it right now, making sure it comes out the right way. Further subsidies to fossil fuels, uh, destroy EPA regulations that might save people but harm profits going on right in front of our eyes. And the question is, will there be counterforces? Um, if not, but before we, we, we move on to, to the discussion maybe of popular movements and how to fight back in this, uh, in the discussion of market failures, they seem to be combining as well with the legacy of institutional racism in the United States. And we see this playing out in the disproportionate impact that the coronavirus is having in black communities. In, in your view, how should we understand this? We, understand it. We, have a, we can understand it by going back four centuries to when the first slaves were brought. I don't want to have to run through the whole history, but the, the most vicious system of slavery in human history is the basis, large part of the basis for US prosperity. Uh, cotton was the oil of the 19th, 18th and 19th century. And you had to have cheap cotton. Uh, you don't get that by uh, following the rules they teach you in the economics department. You get it by vicious, brutal slavery, okay? Uh, that's laid the basis for uh, manufacturing, textile manufacturing, uh, finance, financing all this, commerce, retail, obviously, that went on through much of the 19th century. Well, finally, uh, slavery was formally ended for about 10 years, reconstruction period. And then there was an agreement with the South that uh, they could go on exactly the way they were before. So you get what one of the best books on the topic called Slavery by Another Name. Uh, measures taken to essentially criminalize the black population. So if a guy standing on a black guy standing on a street corner and find him for vagrancy, can't pay the fine, okay, you go to a chain gang. End result was this is the, the great manufacturing revolution of the late 19th century, early 20th century, largely built on what was called, it wasn't called slavery, uh, ownership of the of the black population by the state. It's much better than slavery. If you have slaves, you have to keep them alive. Uh, if you put them in prison, the, pop the government has to keep them alive. You just get them when you need them. And there's no question of uh, lack of discipline or protest or anything like that. But this went on almost until the Second World War. At that point, there were jobs, people had to work, you know. But then comes new forms of imposed slavery. So well into the 19, late 1960s, uh, federal housing laws required segregation. There was a lot of public supported housing going on in the 50s, the Levittowns and so on. But for whites, no blacks, you know, uh, liberal senators voted for this, hated it, but voted for it because there was no other way to get any public housing uh, passed. So then Democrats would kill it. You know. uh, the United States had anti miscegenation laws so severe that the Nazis refused to accept them into the 60s, you know. Then it takes other forms. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, just essentially did what uh, the government did back at the end of Reconstruction, told the southern states you can do whatever you like. It eliminated the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we've just seen this a couple of days ago in Wisconsin. Incredible. If you want to see democracy simply crushed, take a look at what happened two days ago in Wisconsin. Uh, the governor sensibly wanted, democratic governor, wanted to delay the primary and extend uh, absentee voting. I mean, nothing could make perfect, more perfect sense. Uh, the Republican, there is a Republican dominated 
legislature that had a minor, small minority of votes, but gerrymandering gave them the largest number of seats under Republican legislature. Uh, so there was a session, they called a session. I don't think the Republicans even bothered to show up. The uh, majority leader simply called the session and closed it, didn't consider the governor's proposal uh, supported by the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, this is designed to ensure that poor minority voters, people who can't get to the polls easily, mostly Democrats, they won't vote. Uh, the rich, the uh, traditional, uh, the ones who handle all this, they vote. So it's, a way, it's an open way, not even concealed, to try to ensure that no matter what the public wants, the most reactionary policies will be maintained in Poland in, uh, permanently. And Mitch McConnell is the evil genius behind this. He's been doing it beautifully. Uh, make sure that the judiciary is stuffed with young, mostly unqualified, ultra-reactionary justices. That ensures that whatever the country wants in the future, they'll be able to kill it just like the Roberts Court majority is able to do it now. Uh, Republicans know that they're a minority party. There's no way to get votes on their actual programs. That's why they have to appeal to so-called cultural issues, you know, gun rights, abortion, and so on. Not their actual policies, which are stiff the pocket, fill the pockets of the rich. That's the actual policy. Trump is a genius at this. Have to admire him. And with one hand, he says, I'm your savior, I'm working for the poor working guy. With the other hand, he's stabbing him in the back. It's pretty impressive, you know. It's, uh, it's most certainly the most successful con man in American history, maybe ever. Uh, I presume it'll explode sometime, but so far it's maintaining itself. And uh, so you take a look at this. They're trying very hard to dismantle whatever elements of democracy they are. Uh, there are models elsewhere. Uh, Orban in Hungary is doing the same thing, one of their big friends. In fact, it's kind of interesting if you try to, it's pretty hard to identify a coherent uh, geopolitical strategy from the chaos in the White House. But there is one that comes out with considerable clarity. Uh, form a international of the most reactionary states in the world and let that be the basis for u.s power so uh, cc in egypt the worst tyrant in egypt's history uh, the family dictators in saudi arabia in particular mbs the biggest killer uh, uh, israel which is going way to the right and is now at the center of it the former tacit relations of between Israel and the Arab states are now becoming perfectly open. Uh, Modi in India, what he's doing is simply unspeakable. He gave four hours notice for a total lockdown. Most of the population in India is informal workers. They don't have anywhere to go. There's no, they can't stay home, there's no home. So they're trekking on the highways, maybe a thousand miles to some village somewhere dying on the way. Uh, what's this going to do? Impossible to imagine what this is going to do. But since they're mostly poor, and many of them are Muslim, who cares? I mean, so he's a major part of the uh, of this reactionary uh, international. Uh, nice guys like Orban in Hungary are you know, delightful. They love them. Salvini in Italy, one of the worst gangsters around. In the Western Hemisphere, the main representative is Bolsonaro in Brazil, who's vying with Trump to see who could be the worst criminal in the world. You know, Trump easily can beat him because of U.S. power. But you look at the policies, not much different. And that's harming not just Brazil, but the whole world. I mean, current predictions in scientific journals are that in about 15 years, the Amazon will shift from being a net carbon, carbon sink to a net carbon CO2 emitter. That's a disaster. It's all the result of extended 
gifts by Bolsonaro to the mining industries, the agribusiness, all of his friends. Uh, so there are guys trying to create the next world. They're working hard. They always do. They're relentless. Constant class war never stops. And if they're allowed to win, we're toast. And along that lines, um, you've said it's really valuable to read the business press um, because they're often very frank about what they think of the world and what they're doing, uh, what their plans and schemes are. Um, from our viewpoint, we're seeing a lot of uh, rank and file uh, activity in the United States right now. Strikes are taking place in many locations. Um, workers are organizing in response to the coronavirus and, and being encouraged to work in unsafe conditions. Uh, are the employers talking about that and are they worried about it? Oh boy, I know, are they? In fact, the, uh, as you know, every January, uh, the guys who modestly call themselves the masters of the universe gather in Davos, Switzerland to go skiing and talk about how wonderful they are and so on and so forth. This January meeting was very interesting, very interesting. Uh, they see that the peasants are coming with the pitchforks and they're worried about it. So there's a shift. You look at the theme of the meeting, it's, yeah, we did bad things in the past. We now understand it. We're now opening a new era in capitalism, a new era in which we aren't just concerned with, you know, the stockholders, but with the workers and the population. And we're such good guys, so humanists that you can entrust your, your fate to us. We'll make sure everything's fine. And it was pretty interesting to see what happened. There were two main speakers. This should be played in every classroom in the country. Two main speakers. Trump, of course, gave the keynote speech. Greta Thunberg gave the other speech. The contrast was fantastic. Now, the first speech is this raving buffoon, you know, screaming about how great he is and all kind of, you can't even count up the number of the lies. Second speech is a 17 year old girl quietly giving a factual, accurate description of what's happening in the world and looking these guys in the face and saying, you're destroying our lives. And of course, everyone politely collapsed. Nice little girl, you know, go back to school. The reaction to Trump was particularly interesting. They don't like him. His vulgarity and crudity is interfering with the image they're trying to project of dedicated humanists, but they love him. They gave him a round of upstanding applause and couldn't stop cheering because they understand something. This guy, no matter how vulgar he is, knows very well whose pockets to fill and how to fill them. So he can be a buffoon and will tolerate his antics as long as he continues with the policies that count. That's the Davos men. They didn't bother pointing out that there's, we've heard this tune before. Back in the 1950s, it was uh, called the soulful corporation. Corporations have become soulful. Now they're just overflowing with kindness for working people and everyone else. So it's a new year. Uh, we've had some time to see how soulful they were and this will continue. So either we can be taken in by the con and let it go, or you can fight back and create a different world. There's very good opportunities for it now. The strikes that you mentioned, protests all over the world. There's community self-help groups forming neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods where people are helping each other, trying to do something for the elderly who are cooped up. Uh, some of them are astounding. So go to Brazil where it's, the president is just a monstrosity. For him, uh, the whole thing is just a cold. The Brazilians are immune to viruses. We're special people, you know, so on and so forth. The government's doing nothing. Some of the governors are, you know, but not the federal government. The worst of this is going to be in the, uh, as everywhere, in the slums, you know, the impoverished areas, the indigenous areas. The worst slums, like the favelas in Rio, the idea of washing your hands every couple hours is a little difficult when you don't have water. Or uh, 
separating yourself when you're crammed into one room. But there is a group that came and tried to impose some reasonable standards as well as possible under these horrible conditions. Who? The crime gangs that have been terrorizing the favelas. They're so powerful, the police are afraid to go in. They organized to try to deal with the health crisis. It tells you something, just like the nurses on the front line. There are human resources there, and they can come to the fore in the, some of the most unexpected places. You're not, not from the corporate sector, not from the wealthy, not from the soulful corporations, certainly not from governments, particularly pathological ones like this, others are doing better, but from popular action. Uh, that's the hope. Uh, Sanders, when he gave his withdrawal speech, emphasized this. He said the campaign may be ending, the movement isn't. Now it's up to especially his young supporters to put some meat into that. And it can be done, no matter what happens. Trump's re-elected, it's a utter tragedy. Biden's elected, won't be wonderful. But either way, you've got to do what's possible. And it's not out of reach. So do you think most people are going to emerge from their homes after the quarantine is over um, with their political opinions changed or intact? We'll see. It's certainly a time for reflection about the kind of things we were just talking about. Why are we in this situation? I mean, what we were just talking about is not profound. It's on the surface. It's not quantum physics. Think about it a little. It's obvious. So maybe people will do it, or maybe they'll stay mesmerized by the con man in office. I mean, I get letters from people, you know, poor working people who say, you goddamn liberals are bringing all the immigrants to steal our jobs, or our guy Trump is saving us. You know, okay, maybe it's possible to break through to them. It's not easy. These guys are tuned to Fox News all day. That's the echo chamber. In fact, there's a very interesting, if you're looking at it from outer space and you're not suffering from it, you think what's going on. This maniac in the White House comes out and says whatever he says, uh, the opposite the next day. It's repeated with uh, fervor in the Fox echo chamber. It says the opposite the next day, same thing. Meanwhile, He's looking at Fox News every morning to figure out what to say. It's his source of news and information. Uh, the world is in the hand. And then you get the intelligent guys like Mike Pompeo, who says, God sent uh, Trump to earth to save Israel from Iran. That's a sensible guy. I mean, you know, it's, it's some ironic joke being played. Let's say there is a God maybe. If so, he decided that he made a bad mistake on the sixth day, and he's not going to end it with humor. Uh, just watch these people destroy themselves. That's what it looks like. I'm afraid I've got to go off to the next one. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, last question then. Uh, is there the chance that the United States uh, could build up a culture of solidarity and um, a labor politics coming out of this, like you, the UK did after World War II, that could lead to something like the NHS, like recognizing all of these market failures, recognizing the inefficiencies and the complications that are created when you're competing rather than coordinating resources? Is it possible for the United States to, to, sure. to move in that direction? Done it before. Uh, go. I mean, I, I lived through the Depression. That's why this long white beard. But in the 1920s, the labor movement was totally crushed. Take a look at David Montgomery, great labor history. One of his great books is The Fall of the House of Labor. He's talking about the 20s. It was crushed by the liberal Wilson administration, the Red Scare and all the rest. Uh, and the 30s began to revive. Uh, CIO organizing, uh, sit-down strikes, great threat to management, sit-down strike, 
uh, workers are sitting there. Next thing that's going to come to their heads is we don't need the bosses. We can run this place ourselves and then you're done. It's a very fragile system. Uh, that led to reactions. There happened to be a sympathetic administration, which is critical. Very good labor historian, Eric Loomis has studied case after case of this. And he points out that moments of positive change have almost always been led by the active labor movement. And the only times they succeeded were when there was a relatively sympathetic administration, at least a tolerant one. Well, we don't happen to have that now, but actually if Biden came in, it's not going to be great. Could be, could be pushed, you know. If the labor movement revives the Sanders movement, which is very significant, he's achieved great successes. If that can take off, uh, there could be, uh, we once again could get out of the uh, capitalist crises as was done in the 30s. I mean, the, Rose, the New Deal didn't end the depression, the war did with massive state-directed production. But nevertheless, it was much better than today. I'm old enough to remember it. My family, extended family, were mostly first-generation uh, working people, mostly unemployed, uh, living in, under poverty, that much worse than the working class today. But it was hopeful. It wasn't, there weren't deaths of despair. It wasn't you know, feeling the world's coming to an end. The mood was somehow we'll get out of this together, working together. Uh, some of them were in the Communist Party, some were in the labor unions, but uh, like I had a couple of aunts who were unemployed seamstresses, uh, but they were an ill group, which gave them a life. A cultural life, uh, meetings, a uh, week in the country, uh, you know, uh, theater uh, activities that were being carried out. You can do something. We're together, we'll get out of it. Um, that could be revived. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. Okay, good to talk to you. All right, take care. Thank <laughs> you.